Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never practice nunchucks in a crowded room. Never eat chole before a road trip. Always take your shirt off before you iron it. Don't take a call near a swimming pool. And don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. From Colonial Shanghai's Avenue Edward VII, named after a king of England and flamboyant playboy, reviled by his detractors as Edward the Caresser, the Hollywood director Joseph von Sternberg flowed with the hot tide of men entering the great world. Like Dante's circles of hell, the great world pleasure palace's perversions grew as Sternberg ascended the stairwell. There was gambling, there were pimps and pickpockets, magicians and earwax extractors, fireworks, cage birds, a stuffed whale, and girls whose dresses, he wrote, were slit up to the armpits. Looking out from the terrace, Sternberg could see a wide open ground where hundreds, bankrupted by these pleasures, had, I quote, speeded up the return to the street below by jumping off the roof. Earlier this month, United States prosecutors announced that they would be taking to court a Japanese Yakuza crime boss, Takeshi Ebasawa, and his Thai associate, Somfop Singhasiri, both arrested in 2022 for trafficking weapons-grade nuclear material. Funds raised from the deal prosecutors alleged were to finance the purchase of weapons for a so far unidentified insurgent group from Myanmar. The case of nuclear trafficking, though, isn't just about generals and geopolitics. It's entwined with the story of centuries-old criminal brotherhoods and clans in Southeast Asia who forged empires in the crucible of the colonial era using drugs, guns, sex and political power. The foundations of the great world had been laid two centuries before Sternberg visited the place in the early 20th century. During the 18th century, as British demand for tea and silk rose, every ship that sailed from India to Guangzhou carried silver bullion. Early in the next century though, there was a shortage of silver in India. The East India Company needed a product to pay for its purchases. The answer was found in India-grown opium. Faced with a devastating addiction crisis, the Chinese sought to shut down the rising tide of opium. But their efforts were defeated in the First Opium War of 1842. Liberal politician William Gladstone, who would later become Prime Minister, assailed his own nation for forcing China to accept the flow of drugs. He wrote, A war more calculated to cover this country with permanent disgrace, I do not know. Tracing their roots to the ancient heaven and earth society, an order of Shaolin monks and martial arts masters whom legend holds fought off barbarian invaders, the triad criminal brotherhoods of China thrived in the chaos unleashed after the opium wars. Long engaged in rural banditry and rebellion, the triads were soon recruited to help prop up imperial rule in Shanghai. In return for the toleration of their heroin production, gambling and sex work operations, they ensured violence stayed within manageable limits. The scholar Bertel Lindner shows the deal built to Shanghai where, I quote, sin, crime, politics and business existed as a new system of government. The city's Green Gang, for example, served as enforcers for stretched colonial police. French police scholar Lin Pan has noted, Quote, recognized the world of Shanghai for what it was, a jungle of bums, adventurers, opportunists and swindlers. To the French, there were worse things than having, as the Chinese head of police, a man who by virtue of his influence in the underworld, kept the level of crime from brimming over. The Green Gang and other triads also played a central role in propping up nationalist general Chiang Kai-shek's military regime. Green Gang crime boss Snake Eyes Yu Sheng even took charge of the general's intelligence services. Following the communist revolution in China, the cartels were evicted from Shanghai, but they re-established themselves across China's southern border, helped by the Central Intelligence Agency. 
Guomindang military commanders operating along with local ethnic Chinese warlords funded their operations by trafficking opium. Figures like Olive Lang, a convent school educated girl from Lashio who went on to command her own private army, pioneered chains of opium laboratories and trucking lines linking Burma, now Myanmar, with markets worldwide. As they battled multiple ethnic insurgencies, the country's general struck deals with warlords like Lang, giving protection to the opium operations in return for ending hostilities or fighting rival insurgents. Funds from the warlords flowed back too to the generals and the elite around them. A narco state had begun to form. Myanmar would eventually become the world's largest producer of opium. Evidence began to emerge around 2008 that the generals ruling Myanmar thought nuclear weapons might be needed to guarantee the state's survival. Investigators in Japan discovered that North Korean businessman Lee Gyong Hu had evaded export controls to supply a magnetometer and cylindrical grinders to Myanmar. The equipment had applications in many diverse fields but could have been used in missile control systems and uranium enrichment centrifuges. The North Korean connection, of course, raised eyebrows. Two defectors interviewed by the scholar David Ball in 2009 revealed the existence of uranium mining facilities in Myanmar, as well as a research facility and dedicated military support unit. The defectors claimed that the military was putting in place the elements of a full-scale nuclear weapons program using technologies from North Korea and Russia. Evidence in support of their claims proved a little thin, but alarms began to sound in world capitals. Following the election of a democratic government in 2012, Myanmar seemed to roll back its nuclear ambitions. It signed key international accords and seemed to give up all thought of acquiring nuclear weapons. In 2023, though, Myanmar and Russia's state-owned Rosatom signed an agreement to build a small modular nuclear reactor. The reactor wouldn't in itself produce enough material for a nuclear weapon, but there was no clear answer on why a country mired in a crippling financial crisis needed to invest resources in a nuclear energy program when it had abundant supplies of coal and hydroelectric resources. The Yakuza uranium export plot is an evidence that a nuclear weapons program is underway in Myanmar. There are disturbing questions though that no one is answering. Who actually held the stockpile of 2000 kilograms of thorium-232 and 100 kilograms of uranium-3308 that Ebisawa offered to sell? Where did he source the sample of weapons-grade plutonium he supplied to an undercover United States agent who were posing as Iranian buyers? How did an insurgent group obtain access to this stockpile, which would really take the resources of a nation state to maintain safely? We don't have answers to any of these questions. Late in 1953, the elderly man who'd spent his last years hunched over his broomstick, sweeping up the streets outside the great world, finally passed away. For decades, that sweeper, Huang Big Shot Jin Rong, had run the great world as well as a string of other gambling dens and brothels. As a leader of the Green Gang and the affiliated Big 8 cartel, and as police chief of the French colonial section of the city, he battled the communists breaking up trade unions, beating up protesters and arresting radicals. The People's Republic, which took power in 1949, Littner writes, chose to punish Huang with humiliation instead of a bullet through the back of the head. Even as Huang's life ended though, the networks he ran were putting down new routes. Thailand, from where Ebisawa trafficked narcotics from Burma, emerged as the hub for the Southeast Asian cartels. From the 1950s, investigative journalist David Kaplan points out, gambling, drugs, arms trafficking, prostitution, people trafficking and diesel smuggling came to have a key role in the Thai economy. In 1998, these activities generated between 8 and 13 billion US dollars or up to 13% of Thailand's gross national product. Following the Second World War, scholar Eiko Maruko writes, the Yakuza worked with the Japanese government and the CIA to combat trade unions and the left. The crime cartel, whose membership is estimated to have swelled to over 180,000 people in the grim post-Second World War years, was allowed to run Tokyo's red light district, 
extort money from businesses and extensively traffic methamphetamines. The Yakuza soon expanded region-wide. In 1990, more than 200 Yakuza and their associates were believed to be active in Thailand, Kaplan notes, with interests in activities from drug trafficking to property and prostitution. The Yakuza has also been involved in customized trafficking for elite Asians, ranging from selling lemurs to endangered poisonous snakes. In one case in Japan, rumors that they dumped some of these poisonous snakes in a river provoke mass panic. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, mafia organizations from Russia, collectively known as the Brotherhood, also embedded themselves in Southeast Asia. Ties with criminal groups in Siberia were established when Shanghai received large numbers of refugees from the Soviet Union in 1917-19. Some of them so-called taxi girls or upmarket sex workers. The Russian mafia used these connections to embed themselves in heroin trafficking out of Thailand, as well as sex work and money laundering. Macau, one of the destinations for Russian sex workers, also became an important center for the cartels. Led by triad-linked tycoon Stanley Ho, the gambling industry in Macau grew steadily after 1961, catering to affluent ethnic Chinese in Hong Kong and the wider diaspora. China has cracked down hard on illegal gambling because it's feared that it's just a cover for underground banking and money laundering which Chinese elites use to smuggle money out of the mainland. Former police officer Martin Kubrick writes that the islands continue to have significant triad influence though for all of China's efforts. For the most part though, the cartels have lost the patronage and political influence that helped build their empire. In a world made up of modern nation-states, colorful gangsters are not needed to help keep the order. The nuclear dreams of Myanmar's generals might be Asian crime bosses' last hope for a haven where they might escape Huang's miserable end. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm a contributing editor at The Print. Thank you for watching Security Code.